Thank you. Good afternoon. It's amazing to be here all the way from London. And it's amazing to be surrounded by people who actually know what an NFT is, which is quite novel. It's also amazing that I just found a little step on the side, because otherwise you'd have been thinking, like, well, I can hear him, but I can't see him. Um, in the next 10 minutes, we're going to go on a whistle-stop tour, talking about the history and perhaps the future of the photographic medium, how photography has traditionally been bought and sold, and how that translates into this space. And also how to rise above the noise as a creator to kind of stand out, as a collector to find something of true value with uh, an authentic signature. Let me see if I can work this out. Here we go. So my journey to now began 10 years ago uh, when I acquired a magazine called the British Journal of Photography. It's the oldest photography brand in the world, established way back in 1854. And we spent the last 10 years really building community, championing to thousands of photographers and building platforms for them to get their work seen by millions of people through major exhibitions and work with major brands. But none of that was, is as exciting or as scalable as I believe this technology we're talking about today is, which I believe is the biggest opportunity for lens-based artists in a generation. So much so that I've sold 1854 Media now, I'm focusing all of my attention on art3.io with a pretty broad mission to explore photography in the metaverse. Um, but before we dive into that, I just want to talk for a moment about Web3 today. Web3 is horrible. It's horrible. It's not just horrible because it's bad for the environment um, and it's slow and inefficient. And it's not just horrible because it's expensive to develop on and expensive to use. It's mostly horrible because it's different. It asks us to do things differently. But guess what? So did the internet. We are in 1994. Um, I'm old enough to remember 1994. And in 1994, the internet was bad for the environment. It was slow and inefficient. It was expensive to develop on and expensive to use, but mostly it was just different. In 1994, we had digital cameras. They just didn't take very good photographs. We had cell phones, but all they did was make phone calls. It's crazy times. In three decades, a lot's moved on. Um, and, and I have to say, you know, the, the people who championed that technology in 1994, the people who persisted through the tough times, are the people who lead us today. So when did photography come from? Um, about 200 years ago, in 1826, a French scientist called Joseph Niepce invented the first portable camera obscura. And he succeeded in capturing the image on the left there, which was the first photograph that did not fade into nothingness. And today, photography is the most popular, commonplace, and accessible art form in the world, um, both within the art world and within popular culture. It is, I think, without question, our dominant form of communication. But new and ever-changing technology has made us compulsive creators and compulsive consumers of photography. There's billions of photographs taken every single day from every corner of the globe. So whilst we've become fluent in the language of photography and, and, and visual images, it's perhaps without fully understanding it and appreciating its history or its market. In most of our living memories, photography has struggled to be taken seriously as a, as a legitimate art form. It, it was as recently as 2003 that Tate Modern held its first dedicated photography show. Yet in this century, a huge infrastructure has grown up around the medium. In the UK, we have 20,000 photography graduates a year. In the USA, there's over 250 universities offering annual photography courses. 6.6 .6 billion people around the world, that's 83% of the world's population, have a phone or a mobile phone or a camera in their pocket. And there's 300 million pictures uploaded to social media every single day. So photography shapes how we see things. It shapes it's how we present ourselves. It's how we communicate with our friends, how we understand unfolding events. It's how we express who we are. So I don't think it's short to say that photography is the messenger of contemporary life. And perhaps that's the best way to see it in this bonkers place that we call Web3 or the metaverse. And of course, this technology has enabled us to become compulsive collectors in this new chapter of, of perhaps the world's most important and influential medium. So how is photography traded? You know, photography has taken us to the beaches of Normandy. It's taken us into the drug dens of New York, the jungles of Vietnam, down into the dark prisons of Iraq, and up into the sunlit rainforests of Madagascar, or into the clamor of a Black Lives Matter protest. 
Photography then has always been valued by news, and it's long been a professional occupation. And f f photographs have always been bought and sold for mass consumption and usage. But as an artistic practice, tradable, collectible, unique art, that's a very different story. It took the traditional art world 150 years to pay attention. Uh, it's only the 1970s that Sotheby's and Christie's started to auction photographs. Today, it's rare for a gallery not to have some sort of uh, representation of photography. Art fairs like Paris Photo and Photo London attract tens of thousands of visitors every year with millions of dollars exchanged in photographs. Yet even today, photography is considered warily by old school collectors because of the potentially infinite reproducibility of an image. Even though those concerns have really been addressed, um, at least in the fine art, if not the wider world, Man Ray's, the Violin de Ingres, I'm sure it's not said like that, um, was sold in May this year for $12.4 million. It was the most expensive photograph sold at auction. Before that, Andreas Gursky's Ryan II on the left was sold by Christie's in 2011 for $4.3 million. But it was one of six. There were five more identical photographs. Photography has therefore found acceptance in the fine art world by the establishment of limited edition prints. As they sell, they become more rare, the price rises, scarcity is thus created. But in the wider market, in the real world, provenance, provable scarcity still remains an issue for collectors. So where is this all going? Hopefully beyond Shrek memes and beyond the current market that we are in. You know, we like to say we're early, and remember, we really are. Remember, it's, it's 1994. Um, you know, the art world has embraced um, NFTs because of the connection between artists and this new generation of collector. And for me, the most exciting thing is the ability for artists to participate in the future upside of their work. That is absolutely game-changing. For collectors, in the fullness of time, I think that NFTs will eradicate the issues we have in the real world around scarcity and end-to-end -end provenance. I think we'll see an accelerated trend towards ubiquitous use of tokens, way beyond just art. I think today what's happening in this year's conference shows that, the diversity. And I think we'll also see an accelerated trend towards fractional ownership. Early adopters in this space, I think, still have the ability to reap the rewards, although I'm afraid to say that I do think the majority of projects which have little real utility or, or, or don't present authentic art um, will, in the fullness of time, have little value. So let's just put some of that into context and talk about a few of the projects that we've worked on at Art3, which we've got excited about over the last few months, and a sneak preview of, of a couple of the things we've got coming up. So Art3's mission is to educate, to help photographers find their place in this space, to help collectors embrace blue chip works and discover the emerging photographers of tomorrow. Our first group drops introduce hundreds of photographers into the space. It's called Edition 365. And for any artists in the audience, we have the open call for submissions for this year's edition open now. You can find out the details at art3.io. It's free to submit. Since then, we've been experimenting in a few different ways with different typologies, combining elements of PFP projects with authentic human-generated art in truly limited supply. A good example of that is the guy on the left. Um, this was from a project called Japes, or James and Other Apes. The photographer, James Mollison, had traveled the world for four years on four continents, taking amazing large portrait for, uh, images of the, of the great apes and using this sort of passport aesthetic to confer their individuality. Uh, that collection is 20 years old. It had been extensively exhibited and collected world over, but we felt it would translate very well into this space because it combines these stunning large format portraits with the zeitgeist of the moment apes, and the real physical and personality traits and the names of these apes conferred their rarity, and it worked. I think there's two, uh, three of the 52 um, japes left on the primary market on OpenSea now. It's a similar story, the tutu in the middle, the, she, she's an example of one of the super grannies of Corogotcho. It's an amazing project with a wonderful backstory. I don't have time, unfortunately, to tell it to you today, but again, on art3.io, you can read about that project and the inspiration behind it there. And that we're now experimenting with a couple of new projects using um, artists who are really multidisciplinary. Um, Karen Navarro's The Constructed Self, um, the sort of jigsaw puzzle portrait there. This takes her incredible talent of making large 
scale physical portraits using photography at their heart, which get exhibited in real world spaces and translating that into digital sculptures uh, made specifically for the NFT space. And that collection is live on foundation at the moment. On the bottom right corner there, we have Dean Chamberlain's, one of his psychedelic pioneers. So this combines the light painting technique that he developed over 50 years ago with an incredible series of portraits taken over the last number of decades of the people who were the most influential within the psychedelic movement over the last few decades. And the green list for that collection opened today. So all of these collections have a story. They all have blue chip art at their heart. They're all authentic. They're all limited supply. And they all make sense as NFTs, and not everything necessarily does. And I think that's probably one of the key takeaways here. This is a really noisy space. So for artists, you need to stand out and be unique and also be patient. It can take many years for uh, even established artists to find the true signature that's been talked about a lot today. For collectors, there's a hell of a lot out there. Um, and unfortunately, not a huge percentage of it is what I would call authentic. So you need to look behind what's perhaps aesthetically pleasing, um, visual karaoke, as we may have called it in, in the BJP days. And you know, for, for, for photographic NFT art to have longevity, I think it has to have context. So you need to research the artists, um, look for where they've been supported or championed by credible media and institutions, both in and outside of the NFT space, because the two are yet to collide in any meaningful way. But whether artist or collector, you know, I think photography is yet to have its true moment. It is coming, so I would just say persevere. You can check our drops out at art3.io. We've got one coming up for Moonbirds fans, the owl in the middle there, which is going to drop as stealthily as he may on his prey. Uh, you can DM me at Mark Hartog. I hope that something in this has been of interest. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>